Hi, I'm Colleen Caro. Welcome to Avant Grad, Ohio's Trailblazers. I'm here in the podcast studio of Schoonover Center on Ohio University's Athens campus. Schoonover Center is home of the Scripps College of Communication and the Scripps School of Journalism. I'm sitting very close to the former offices of The Post, the campus newspaper, where our next guest spent many long days and nights cutting his teeth during some of the most turbulent years of our nation's history. Clarence Page is now a nationally celebrated syndicated columnist and also one of Ohio University's greatest treasures in journalism. An utterly wise and spirited soul, he has a unique way of opening your eyes while also making you smile. Thanks for joining me for Avant Grad, Ohio's Trailblazers. Hi, Clarence. Hi, Colleen. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? Good, good. Thank you so much for being with us today. You've been really, really generous with Ohio University with your time and talent. I know you've been back to campus a bunch and interviewed quite a bit. So I'm really tickled to be able to talk to you today. Well, I'm really tickled to be able to talk to you too. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And it's it's special and sweet for me too, for a couple of reasons. One is I grew up in the Chicago suburbs, as you know. So I grew up reading your columns and um, I'm also a Scripps grad, so um, it's it's nice to see things come full full circle, and it's super exciting for me to talk to you. I feel feel a little bit like I'm talking to a rock star. So, <laughs> uh, you, you butter me up much too much here, but thank you. Like it's it. the truth, and you know, if it's funny because. If I had realized, I, I didn't know when I when I was attending Ohio University, when I applied for the Scripps School, if I had realized that you were an Ohio University graduate, I, I might just have tried to reach out to you. Oh, um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, then you finally got around to it. Exactly. Many, many years later. But I'm, so I'm yeah. glad you finally made it. Indeed. Me too, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So I have a bunch of questions for you today. Um, I, I hope you don't mind being in, in the interviewee seat. I know you do a lot of interviewing and, and reporting. Um, I find that it's it's pretty fun to be interviewed as well. But oh, yeah. um, I I wanted to start with, with your upbringing in Dayton. So you were born and raised in Dayton, right? Actually, I was born in Dayton and raised in Middletown, to be okay, uh, raised in accurate Middletown. about this. Yeah. Great. And, and, you know, when you're outside Ohio, folks don't hardly know the difference. But uh, I know my uh, uh, mom and dad went up to Dayton uh, so I could be born there. <laughs> and then I uh, uh, grew up in Middletown. And uh, later I would intern in the, uh, at the uh, Dayton Journal-Herald, the late lamented Dayton Journal-Herald. Uh, so uh, I will, will use Dayton and Middletown almost interchangeably. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm from the Miami Valley. Nice. And you, so you started in journalism when you were in high school. You mm -hmm. were, um, worked on the newspaper there and you received your first award, according to my research, um, when you were a senior, I think, if I'm correct. Um, oh, for wow, the year's quite best thorough paper. research you're doing there. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, you know, I'm a journalist, right? So you got um, I'm, proud of you. <laughs> I'm wondering. If you recall what that story was that, that you won oh, yeah. the award for. Oh, yeah. I even have two or three copies left. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, that was 1965. Yeah. But our, uh, our advisor to our newspaper, Mrs. Mary Kendall, bless her heart, God rest her soul, uh, just passed away a few years ago at the age of 103. Oh, uh, my but goodness. She, indeed, uh, she was the one who first put the book of journalism in my ear. Uh, when I was at, at Middletown High School, and uh, the uh, uh, the article there, uh, <laughs> it, it's part of my digression. But you know, uh, when Mrs. Kendall suggested, "Have you ever thought about journalism?" Because she uh, saw that I, you know, uh, uh, well, I've been writing some stories for the high school paper, and uh, I was like, to tell you the honest truth, I, I really joined the paper in, in order. In order to have a social life, because I didn't have much of one. And there you know, go. when you, but when you're a reporter, you get to interview the homecoming queen, the captain of the football team, uh, blah blah <laughs> blah. You, know, you get to go out, and uh, as I would later say, uh, be an eyewitness to history, <laughs> and, and had no idea how much history I was going to be an eyewitness to. But I was just doing it for, for fun, 
And uh, the uh, uh, Mrs. Kendall suggested, uh, you know, have you ever thought about this for a career? And I, I, I thought she was, she was nuts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, as time went on, uh, it became more and more apparent. I mean, I, I remember I was in the class of 65 and uh, history was happening all around. It was. Uh, it yeah. was, uh, you know, Dr. King was marching. The, uh, you, you had uh, 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 his I Have a Dream speech delivered there on, on, uh, in Washington. Uh, you had uh, the four little girls who were killed in Birmingham. That was a, a big story at that time, the Freedom Riders. Uh, then uh, JFK was assassinated uh, in the middle of my junior year. And, uh, in, uh, and then uh, about hardly a month later, these four long-haired guys from England called the Beatles came to the United States. And all, all of a sudden, every copy of Time magazine, Look magazine, Life sold out in Middletown newsstands by noon. And I mean, uh, this phenomenon was going on. And I think all, all of that uh, persuaded me that journalism would be a fun business to get into. Uh, and I, and I, I could actually make a living. And uh, so anyway... Sorry for making a short story long, but uh, uh, it was such fond memories. I it was um, our uh, de debate team coach, uh, uh, Mr. Jim Butch, uh, an Ohio University grad himself. Who, when he heard I was interested in journalism, he said, "Hey, you know, Ohio U's got a, a good journalism school." <laughs> he was always it. pitching yeah. Ohio U every all the time. You know, a good Bobcat. He was always pitching Ohio U all the time. And I thought, oh, "There's Mr. B Butch again," but. Uh, again, to make a long story short, although it's too late for that now, <laughs> I, <laughs> I went to I here. We, this, is, this, is, this is the good stuff. This is the stuff we want to hear. So please don't apologize. Well, it was really the, the student newspaper that really uh, attracted me. Uh, the, the OU Post uh, was one of the few papers in the country that actually uh, was a daily, a campus daily. Uh, and uh, we, we had five, uh, the Post had just gone to, to five uh, issues per week uh, when, when I uh, entered as a freshman. And um, it was uh, uh, important because it wasn't the laboratory papers, we used to say. It was one that's really uh, semi-independent. Right. So that uh, we, we, we were left to sink or swim on our own. And it was a thoroughly professional style experience. And the biggest problem that we had was spending too much time at the newspaper and not enough time in class. That's a old <laughs> Post tradition, which a number of today's post people tell me still goes on. Yes. But, but yeah, that's how it all began. Well, I love hearing that you you started with a student newspaper so you could become more involved and get to know people. We tell that to our, our students at Ohio University a lot, right? Get involved, get out there, spread your wings, see, see what interests you. You'll meet people, make friends. And so I love that you were doing that even as a high school student and, and to see where it led you. It's That's super right. fun. It's it's super fun to hear you mention the post, of course, because naturally I was going to ask you about that. There was a recent story in Ohio Today magazine. Um, and it's called On the Record, I believe. And it talked, it, it was you and Andy Alexander and a couple other posties talking about your experiences. And I have to say, I, I don't know if, if you've, you've looked at the, the final piece recently, but there are some black and white photos featured with that piece that are just outstanding. <laughs> Photos of ah, okay. in the newsroom. And I have to say, Clarence, you had quite a presence. <laughs> quite a presence. So you you really, you looked, you looked the part. I mean, you were doing the work. You were do, doing the journalist. But you did not <laughs> like a college student. You looked like a pro journalist. Well, uh, well, thank you. Uh, suffice it for now to say that I, I had a lot more hair. I, and I... <laughs> <laughs> like this, yeah. <laughs> and a uh, mutton chop sideburns, and and my uh, John Lennon granny glasses, as I call them, uh, and uh, we're all in bell bottom jeans. Of course, it's the '60s, for heaven's sake, uh, and, and those are those are great. You know, the great advantage to working for a student newspaper is years later, uh, the photographers on your staff have now gone into, into professional careers and they put all those old pictures in the garage or the attic yeah. or something. And then they get to be my age and you start pulling them out of the attic garage. And so these pictures now in the Facebook era, they, they start popping up on the web. Right. So it's very surreal. But yeah, you know, uh, I'm so glad that uh, Ken Steinhoff is really good uh, for, for that sort of thing. And he, uh, he went to the Palm Beach Post and uh, 
I had a terrific career and all. Uh, but those pictures now, unlike most college grads who are looking back uh, and, and saying, gee, did that really happen or did I just dream that up? Now there's photo evidence. <laughs> So. Exactly. Exactly. It's funny that you you mentioned the the, the wardrobe, the the style, you know, the clothes you were wearing, because that's something that really jumps out in the photos as well. In fact, one of the images, um, you're you're sitting in a chair, kind of you have your your head resting on your your hand, and you have on a white colored shirt, and you have this chunky chunky beaded necklace on. Do you do you recall yeah. the photo? We call them love beads in those days. Uh, I have to give history lessons to you, uh, folks too young. To, please to do, please do. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, those were my love beads, and um, I um, uh, I think I had a well. I, I still have have a, a, a Grateful Dead sticker on, on the back of my iPhone uh, <laughs> to commemorate uh, my interviewing Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead backstage at Memorial Auditorium in 1967. Uh, when they were still a, a, a new band, and wow! Up, uh, uh, and, and and in the morning we didn't we didn't have Twitter in those days. So like in the morning, somebody over over by Baker Center told me, "Hey, the Grateful Dead are coming." I said, "When tonight? What?" <laughs> and word spread like wildfire, and there they were that evening. And so I went backstage once again, a good a good post reporter that I am. And, and there was Jerry Garcia tuning up his guitar and smoking some funny cigarettes. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Garcia, I'm with the student newspaper. Can I talk to you? <laughs> and we just had a wonderful time. I, I met Big Pen and uh, uh, the other member, Bob Weir, the rest of the members of the band. Wow. Uh, and uh, that, that's the kind of thing, you know, that, that made me happy to be a J major. I, I met a lot of, of uh, big time stars at Ohio U because, you know, they all come to us. <laughs> Right. You, you get that media pass and it gets you access to so many incredible experiences. Yeah, indeed. I, I'm reminded of some of the work you did um, earlier in your career also, which I didn't realize that you freelanced as a rock music critic for the tempo section of the Chicago Tribune. That's right. That, just, um, that was really exciting for, for me to uncover. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think that was the early yeah. 70s. Uh, so yeah, well, that was... Yeah, it was early 70s. I, I graduated from Ohio U in 69, uh, went uh, right to the Tribune because that was the last good year for journalism jobs as it turned down right before Watergate. Uh, and Watergate caused a lot of young people to want to be reporters all of a sudden. But, but uh, I, I went to the Tribune and uh, I, I was drafted six months later, came back in 71. So I'm, I actually started uh, uh, um, uh, freelancing uh, as a rock critic and a, um, a writer uh, for, uh, back in, in 69, using the experience I got backstage at the Memorial Auditorium and Grover Center uh, at OU, because we did have the stars coming to us. I mean, in, in my, I remember my freshman, sophomore years, uh, you know, the Mamas and the Papas and the Supremes, uh, the Temptations. Mm -hmm played homecoming one year. I mean, Smokey Robinson uh, and, and I, while he was getting dressed back in the locker room, uh, we had a, had a great talk. Uh, and uh, I'm mean, going on the association, which no no young person remembers now, but back then they were hot. That's incredible. Uh, it was really a, a, a terrific experience. And uh, uh, I could spend all day and all night talking about uh, uh, the various folks. But, but when I got to Chicago, a similar thing happened that uh, uh, while I was working as, uh, as, as a, a new reporter in the newsroom, uh, the feature section, um, looking for free, good freelancers to send out uh, to concerts. And uh, I wound up uh, uh, covering both the, well, reviewing uh, and or reporting on a wide variety of folks, uh, some of whom, like uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders uh, and um, uh, James Brown. You know, and the, tempta the Temptations, I interviewed a total of, of uh, four times, both at Ohio U and uh, in uh, various Chicago engagements. Uh, James Brown, I uh, got to see various phases of James Brown. Uh, and um, uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders, another hot band, a, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 a ripoff of the Beatles and all there in the um, late 60s, they came to... Uh, uh, Ohio U and uh, when I was in Chicago, uh, they came, uh, their, their two leaders uh, came 
over to the Tribune uh, to be interviewed by me and we, the young women in the audience in the office went crazy uh, <laughs> when they came in and I said, "Hey, I'm hot stuff in this business," you know. Uh, anyway, uh, one after another, it, it, it was a fascinating experience. But what I really enjoy, though, is um, uh, the offbeat music. Chicago is a great music town in so many ways, especially is, the yeah. blues. Yeah, you know, there was uh, one of my, I, I just a couple of days ago talked with a friend of mine, uh, Bruce Iglauer, who was the same age as me and from Cincinnati. And he, he uh, had just arrived in uh, Chicago about the same time I did. And he was a big blues fan. And uh, the blues, you must remember, it was fading fast uh, by the late 60s. Motown was really, really hot, you know, mm-hmm. that, a new soul, a rhythm and blues. And I, uh, it was a couple of friends of mine in James Hall, a, a, a couple of, of a white guys from Pittsburgh who loved the blues. And I, I wasn't that turned on about it, but, but they helped me to appreciate it. And uh, a band called Paul Butterfield Blues Band was opening in, in Chicago there in 65, 66, and was single-handedly bringing the blues back, only now with, with white audiences. Uh, years later, I would interview B.B. King, and I, and I said, do you, you feel resentful about white musicians uh, getting credit for your work? And he said, heck, if it wasn't for those white boys, the blues would be dead. I'd probably be dead. <laughs> he was very, very happy that, that it, it had found a new life. Among uh, among the hippies, the same young folks who, who were Grateful Dead fans, uh, I, I remember BB played in Baltimore uh, there around '67, uh, and it was it was a black audience, and the young people didn't want to hear blues; they, they thought it was handkerchief head music, and they, they booed it. BB was 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 brought to tears uh, backstage that he felt so rejected by his own people. And then they, they booked a concert at the Fillmore West in San Francisco. And uh, they arrived out there in, in the tour bus and they saw all these white kids uh, lined up in front of the theater. And somebody said, this must be the wrong theater. And uh, the guy who was directing traffic outside said, no, just pull it up and back. And he went on back, they, they went into the theater and it was full of young, young white people. And he, uh, Phil Graham, the owner of the Fillmore, one of the great mm-hmm. uh, voice, one of the great managers in, in the rock era, came out on stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, the king of the blues, Mr. B.B. King. Oh, wow. The crowd just went nuts. They were just jumping up on the seats and they were just cheering B.B. and the band. They were just astonished. <laughs> to go from Baltimore to this, you know, in, in, in one tour. But it, w- it was great moments like that that really uh, made me so happy to be a journalist in the position to be able to talk to history like this, people who were making history. And uh, B.B. did okay for himself. Now you can't, you can't let go dead. Him. Anyway, I was just talking, talking about Bruce Iglauer, same age as me, uh, from Cincinnati. He was a blues fan. He liked the blues, got a job at Delmark Records in Chicago, one of the great labels. But Delmark was 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 in trouble like the rest of the old uh, blues labels and, and the record industry in Chicago, for that matter. And there was this one blues man, Hound Dog Taylor, who didn't have management. So uh, Bruce adopted him and said, I'm going to make sure you get recorded. And he started a record company with one artist, Hound Dog. And uh, that great. was that- 1971, and it's Alligator Records. Look it up. Uh, and if, if you're not a blues fan, if you're a blues fan, you'll have to look it up. Uh, he, he has since uh, then, now he's, oh gosh, I, I, I forget how many uh, artists he has now, uh, maybe 40 or 50. Uh, he's got a staff of like 18 people, and uh, uh, he's been honored at the Blues Hall of Fame, and uh, uh, he was a leader in organizing the Chicago Blues Fest, et cetera, et cetera. So 50 years later, now we're two of us were reminiscing about <laughs> all that has happened over those years, uh, and he got to be an eyewitness to it and, and, and be the kind of a guy who, who pushed history ahead, and mm-hmm. I uh, really... I'm, I'm, I'm so happy about the uh, all that Ohio University did to prepare me for these kind of changes we've seen over the last half century. Well, you know, this podcast is about trailblazing alumni and all of these experiences you're, you're sharing really 
bring to light all the trails that you have blazed, um, especially uh, being a black man in journalism, you know, during these tumultuous years and um, living through the civil rights movement in the 70s and um, your experience with, with rock and roll and blues. I, I, I have to say it would be so lovely for you to maybe write a book about these, these memories you have you know, especially in music, you're just a walking treasure trove of these stories. And and now in this day, when we, when we really, we have lost in recent years, some of these icons, we're, we're losing them. And, um, you know, your stories about these early years and the experiences you've had. And um, as you said, you know, seeing suddenly these audiences full of white listeners and, and just how different that was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's really, uh, and also, well, just uh, to put the, to, to put the blues to rest, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> well, we never expanded. want to do that, but <laughs> yeah, well, they've, they've expanded their audience. Uh, that's the great thing. It's like there's there's yeah. blues clubs now that weren't uh, here before, and Bruce is now, by many measures, the largest blues label in <laughs> Alligator. The uh, largest one in the country, if not the world, and it is a, a music that's got global appeal, and, and uh, all generated right right here in America. But I I felt like um, the uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to have been had the opportunity to, to uh, witness the history that I've seen uh, going to college in the late '60s. Um, the turbulence in the world that you read about all. Um, reverberated at Ohio U uh, yeah. and uh, uh, much of it. Well, uh, the war on poverty, LBJ came to um, Appalachia there and to Athens and other places uh, to launch the war on poverty uh, in yeah. the mid sixties. And I worked uh, for Upward Bound during the summer of 67 uh, there in Athens, uh, working with, with high school kids from across Appalachia. And it, it was a great, experience for me uh, and, and uh, my post connections really got me into it because I didn't even heard about this. I was, was going to go work at the steel mill again uh, in, in the summer and uh, uh, my friend said, said hey you want to be uh, what in the in the uh, domestic peace corps we should refer to it that way you know because because these were young volunteers who were in in the teacher corps in the upward bound uh, in other anti-poverty programs and uh well, when people debate about the world poverty, did it work or not? Well, I'm an eyewitness. I, I saw it do a lot of good. You know, no program is perfect, but uh, a lot of people got opportunities that didn't happen before, and we, we learned a lot. But the main thing is, uh, you talk about uh, having a book. Uh, I love to write a book about music, but but I really uh, right now I'm I'm looking at uh, uh, doing a book just about uh, what I I have learned from programs like. Uh, the war on poverty and uh, from, from the politics I've seen over the years and the uh, uh, really economic uh, decay we've seen across the industrial Midwest uh, since the early 60s, uh, since the time when, when my hometown, Middletown, was an all-American city and uh, now it's the city of a hillbillyology, uh, J.D. Right. Vance, a wonderful memoir. Uh, and um, I, I, I know J.D., uh, now, uh, again, because of, of journalism, and I admired his, uh, his book so much, uh, but he and I went to the same high school there in Middletown High, and uh, only uh, about 30 years apart. Mm -hmm. He's younger than me. But when I came out of, out of Ohio U, uh, we had more journalism jobs uh, than there were journalism majors <laughs> to fill the possibilities. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's how I wound up at, at the Chicago Tribune right after graduation at, at the Dayton Journal Herald. But uh, after my junior year, uh, and uh, um, uh, there was uh, I could work at the steel mill at a time when, and check the record on this, tuition was seven hundred and seventy dollars when I started. Oh wow! In '65, and uh, uh, by the time JD came along, of course, tuition, and, and he went to Ohio State because uh, not everybody can get into Ohio U. But anyway, he, he made something of himself anyhow. And later went to Yale Law School and all, but but he grew up. Uh, in uh, uh, what the same kind of blue collar uh, world that I grew up in there in Middletown. Uh, but there were jobs back when I grew up there. Uh, when he was coming up, uh, his grandfather worked at the steel mill there, but there weren't the many steel mill jobs uh, compared to the way it had been. And, and that was just part of the devastation that, that occurred across Ohio. You know, 
uh, Youngstown, Springfield, Akron, Toledo, uh, all along, uh, they've had more economic problems because, well, you know, as the JD calls it, being on the losing side of globalism, many people wound up on that side. And, and now we need to really unify efforts to try to help Ohio and the rest of the upper Midwest redevelop and have, have, have a new hope. And that is something that uh, I feel like those of us who came up through that uh, generation and have had these kind of experiences uh, can offer some insight and some kind of leadership or advice or uh, improve communications. Uh, and uh, so that's a, been a, a big challenge for me now. How can we use journalism to get beyond uh, the back and forth of uh, arguments in politics and get toward the, what the real job should be, which is problem solving? Yeah, and your experience lends itself so well to that. You know, another thing that stands out to me from earlier in your career is um, I believe you received your your first Pulitzer when you were quite young um, in 1972 yeah. a, a, on a story about voter fraud. What, what were yeah, you, 20, 20, I shared a Pulitzer. Four, 25 years old? <laughs> what, let's what's, be, how you know, did you do that? Let's That's be, incredible. be very honest. Uh, well, well I, I was, was going to say, let's give credit where it's due. Uh, I, I was part of a team of about two dozen reporters <laughs> and uh, uh, who uh, uh, fanned out and uh, worked the polls. And uh, uh, one of our team actually got a got a job at the Board of Election Commission uh, headquarters where he had access to the files and, and found people who were down as who were uh, you know, on record as having voted when they actually died several years before. I know it's hard to believe that would happen in Chicago, but <laughs> this is, you know, we wanted to really find out what's the, what's the truth behind all the rumors and the legends about voter fraud. And uh, so this has helped me years later to say the least now that it's a, a big political issue again. Uh, but, sure. the, but at that time uh, it was, uh, uh, well, as part of, of that team, we, we got, got a Pulitzer uh, for the work that we did. Uh, and then I, I later got a Pulitzer that I, I, I did not share. It was for commentary, and that was yeah. for my yeah, for, at the Tribune, yeah. But uh, when I was fresh out of high school, I'm sorry, when I was fresh out, out of Ohio U, yeah. uh, and um, uh, had not, through my usual tireless self-promotion, made much of a name for myself yet, I was able to work undercover and uh, learn a lot from the precinct captains and the ward bosses and all there in Chicago that I had not been taught in political science class. <laughs> so it's really interesting uh, to see. Uh, at the same time, though, I really got a lot of respect for people, uh, for, for what I call grassroots democracy, uh, for people who volunteer in their own neighborhoods to get out and register people to vote and, uh, and get them to come out to the polls, uh, really put some action behind their beliefs, uh, but it has to be credible. Elections have to be credible. You see what a big what debate argument we're having uh, yeah. over uh, whose votes get counted and whose don't and uh, uh, how we ought to run elections and how we shouldn't, et cetera, et cetera. Because uh, that's the core of democracy, the core, the core of, our, of our existence as it's a free society that's still a model for the rest of the world. We got to keep it that way. Pardon, pardon my soapbox, but that's what I do. I'm a commentator. <laughs> yes, well, I, as I said, no, no apologies. We, we love it when you're on your soapbox. It's, it's great. We, we learn so much from you and, and um, enjoy it as well. I, I, I like to jump ahead a little bit to, um, to, to today and to the last year. Um, thinking about what what the last year has been like for you, both you know as a journalist who has had all these experiences, I love that you connected you know the voter fraud issue of the early seventies to to today. But um, both you know your perspective, both as a journalist um, and a black man, you know who um, you again were drafted into the Vietnam War, you experienced um, the civil rights movement, um, you were uh, an extreme minority at Ohio University. Um, yet you were interviewing, you know, black musicians who were also in the minority. Just a lot of really um, interesting um, tensions there, and you know, thinking about what what the last year has been like for you, having had that that perspective, alongside the deep changes in journalism, 
right? And so, yep. you know, we, we the advent of email and the internet and social media and um, and Zoom and um, you know just so much. And so it's a it's a big big question. It's not not really one question, but you're a commentator, so I, I would just love to to get inside your head a little bit about some of those tensions. Yeah, well, starting with with uh, my college years, you know, going to uh, co- going to college, uh, especially at Ohio University, uh, between sixty five and sixty nine, uh, that was a period when we had over three hundred uh, major episodes of civil unrest in this country, uh, and uh, that was you know because of the Vietnam War, because of the dynamics of, of urban policy uh, and poverty and and uh, police behavior. Uh, those issues led to the. Uh, riots of, of that time and, and, and major protests. And uh, of course, my generation also, uh, my generation of, of guys had the draft hanging over our heads. I mean, we talked about that every day of course, uh, yeah. because it was over our heads every day. You woke up in the morning thinking about it, you know, am I going to Am I going to lose my one Y? One Y was the, was the, cat, the uh, draft board's classification for student deferment. So the whole time I was at Ohio U, the full time student, I would I was deferred. So every right. day uh, the government's just holding back, waiting for you to be ready, <laughs> and waiting and for we, you to graduate. <laughs> yeah, we kept pushing for the war to end before that happened. You know? And it was a uh, but you know just a year after I uh, I was um, I graduated uh, the uh, and I was working in in um, uh, Chicago. For, uh, was it four months went by before I got my draft notice <laughs> after I got my diploma. And um, I, um, uh, I went off to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and then to uh, Fort Ben Harrison, Indiana, what was then the defense journalism school uh, where they trained military journalists. How about that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, just luck- luckily. Uh, Lu- very luckily. Yes. But anyway, I was uh, between that uh, and uh, heading uh, uh, from there, heading to Fort Lewis, Washington, where I expected to be shipped to Germany. Uh, I'm sorry, I expected to be shipped to Vietnam because that was such a, a popular embarkation point at that time. Uh, I wound up in, in Germany, actually. Uh, just, that's a, another little story. But before that, I, I thought I was going to Vietnam. I was. I just finished Fort Ben Harrison, and I had a few days uh, uh, to transport myself to the West Coast. And I said. I'm going to stop by Athens, perhaps for the last time I'll ever be able to see it. And uh, I dropped in uh, to uh, OU on a Sunday afternoon, and uh, everybody was heading to Baker Center because uh, that was where one of the few TVs were on campus. You know, people just didn't have te- televisions in their room like they do nowadays, of course, or, yeah, yeah, or in, in their hip pockets. And so it was a huge crowd of of people because Richard Nixon was giving an important speech that night where he announced his incursion into Cambodia. Uh, and um, everybody was outraged because we were hoping the war was winding down. It looked like uh, he was expanding it. People poured into the streets there in Athens and, and, and at every state university across Ohio, uh, students poured into the streets. And uh, it wasn't until the next day, as I recall, or the day after that, uh, uh, National Guard were being called into campuses around the state, and uh, the National Guard was called into the Athens County Fairgrounds right outside of uh, the city uh, at the time. But we all know, unfortunately, what happened at, at Kent State the next yes. day is uh, that awful tragedy occurred when I, I was out on the campus green in the middle of the day, and, and suddenly people are running across the campus saying, saying they opened fire at Kent State. And and uh, we know now, you know, four dead in Ohio. That was it. Yeah. And uh, so I felt like it was like a bookend on those years. Now, you know, I started out with the assassination of JFK, and then I, I'm ending it with the four dead in Ohio. And uh, that was uh, so for, for my generation. That was uh, those were formative years, and we'll never get over it. People talk about uh, you know all, all all the hippies uh, returning back to to the street. Uh, a life, whatever. Uh, but in fact, there was a sense in, in those years of um, some kind of uh, that, that there was, history was being made. There was, was a sense like uh, 
uh, people kind of put their career plans on hold in a way, either partly or fully, uh, to be involved in what was going on at that time. And it, it was uh, rather chaotic. It wasn't really organized, uh, if you will. You had lots of organizations, you know, SDS, Black Panthers, and, uh, and anti-war mobilization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there was just a general spirit of, of change that was uh, uh, captivating a lot of us. And so it's like, now, now they make movies about it. I, I watch the, the movies about the Black Panthers, weather men, uh, weather underground, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we have uh, young people, uh, uh, like like my son used to say, Dad, what was it like in the old days? Uh, he doesn't ask anymore because I go on talking too long. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, that was, uh, you know, it continued on like, like that, though, because when I got back to Chicago, you had uh, a lot of politics going on there that was uh, affecting the, the uh, rest of the country. And then I've been reporting out of Washington since the early 90s. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, just, it just doesn't quit. But you, know, you can still be surprised. You know, I uh, I was never expecting to live long enough to see number one a black president. <laughs> and okay, uh, right. we have that. Yeah, I was teary eyed as in the other old time where to yeah. see you know, the, the kind of change that that represented. And then I never thought I would be old enough to to see a bunch of uh, of uh, disgruntled. Uh, working class citizens um, uh, try to take over the capital. And I was down there when that happened too. And I, I had to stay in my car with a, a mask on because of the of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but I was able to, to see what was happening, um, just not believing it. But I, I realized though, looking back at my experiences in so many ways, we always knew this kind of thing could happen. We just didn't think it would. But the idea of having an uprising of civil unrest against the government and insurrection uh, against the government uh, by uh, Americans in the name of freedom <laughs> and in the name of democracy, uh, we, we knew it could happen theoretically, but nah, it's not going to happen here. Well, now we see what happens when we don't pay attention to what folks at the grassroots level, if you will, uh, feel about a world that where change is going on, but they're not being heard, and, and they feel like they want to uh, want to get back at the system that has ignored them for whatever reason. Uh, so this is uh, very important, I think, for journalists to know uh, that how uh, we our, our job is to keep track of what's going on in society, but things can happen right in front of our eyes or right beneath our feet, and we don't even even uh, realize it. So it is certainly heightened. So it's a wake up call for me, and just heightened my awareness of uh, what change really means. It's really incredible to think about your experience on campus with the National Guard, and that you happen to be there for that. Um, and and then also to as, as you mentioned the the events at, at the Capitol, it feels like there are some some parallels there almost with with the type just the type of activity. Yes, and that's that's when it gets depressing because <laughs> you like to think after fifty years we've learned better than this, but no, we have learned. Some have learned, some have not, and we also forget. Memories can be short. That's of what course. Really yeah yeah. yeah. Because, like I say, yeah, I, I remember when the, when the National Guard was coming on onto the campuses, uh, and uh, I think we, and I, I remember larger than that, just just the war, the idea of being uh, uh, drafted into a war, and then afterwards realizing it was a colossal mistake. And I'm talking about our, our, our national leaders realizing this was a colossal mistake. And I said, well, back then, uh, uh, I said, well, at least we won't make this mistake again. People learn better. But that, that was before Iraq and a whole bunch of other uh, 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 outbreaks of war that I thought we were too, too smart to get fooled into again. But it has happened. And so that's why you know, democracy is not something that just uh, uh, just to, to remember on multiple choice history test and then forget about it later on. It's something that we have to live every day and realize the importance of it or, or else it, it, it can be taken away from us. And to your point about journalism being so important for helping us remember and, you know, linking these historical events together for us, because we do tend to forget. Yeah. And that's uh, something that, well, uh, one of our 
I'm learning in basic reporting class. Uh, maybe you did too. Uh, that, that we're writing a, a history in a hurry. <laughs> it's uh, that's kind of the way it uh, it turns out. We are, and, and I mean, I, I realize how fortunate I was to be an, an eyewitness to history. Uh, and um, sometimes you know what you're covering is going to be history. Sometimes you don't. And I, um, uh, I, I remember one morning I uh, uh, came to work and, and I heard on the radio that, uh, uh, she, that Justice Thurgood Marshall was retiring from the Supreme Court. As you know, the, the first African-American member of the high court, and it was uh, uh, back in 1991, I just uh, come to Washington, but I come to Washington so I could be closer to history. And so as I was heading downtown on, on my way to work, I said, I got to go over and because because they were, they were going to have a, uh, a Marshall was having a press conference over at the Supreme Court building right, right behind the Capitol. And uh, I, I drove over to the Supreme Court building and uh, I tried to park on Capitol Hill, which is always hard anyway. I, <laughs> right. I, I just went on my own because I'm a columnist now. I can just go where, where I, I want to go. And uh, I have a whole bunch of reporters, all of whom look so young to me. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, uh, realizing I'm, I'm getting to that elder statesman time in life. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I just mingled in, in with the uh, press mob. And uh, they all had one question for Marshall. Uh, and that was, uh, who do you want to replace you? Because... Uh, there were uh, lots of headlines, lots of speculation that uh, President Bush, this was the first Bush, uh, was going to appoint Clarence Thomas, a, a, a noted black conservative. Uh, and um, uh, Marshall didn't want to get pulled into that game, but he had the most clever ways of putting us, <laughs> of, of, of dodging answers to the question. Of course. Like the, most, the, the most memorable was uh, when he, he, uh, he was asked, uh, uh, Justice Marshall, would you like to see a black uh, replacement of, uh, uh, on the Supreme Court? And he responded like the Delphic Oracle. He said, ain't, I was told a long time ago, ain't no difference between a black snake or a white snake. They both bite. That was his answer. <laughs> so great. That was his answer. <laughs> yeah, no. And I thought, this is terrific. I'm, I'm writing all this down. And these young reporters around me were just so, uh, you know, they weren't getting that big headline that they wanted, you know. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, I know how that. you're a young reporter. You want that big headline. So you forget. You don't think about the little headlines you, you can make. It. And finally, um, uh, I piped up and I said, uh, Mr. Justice Marshall, uh, how would you like to be remembered? And he looked up at me across the room, and and he and he uh, once again like the Delphic Oracle. He said he did the best he could with what he had, and that was it. And that quote wound up on uh, the headline on a double truck, as we call yep. it, double truck, right? But it like crossed two pages in Time Magazine the next week because it just really summed up that moment uh, did, with yeah. Marshall and, and and for the rest of us. So, you know, this is something you'll, you'll learn from experience. You know, uh, you, you don't need that big headline if the little headlines <laughs> can, 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 can be big enough in themselves. And I've run across so many episodes like that. It's hilarious. That's incredible advice for young journalists and, 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 and other folks out there. I, how do you remember all of this? I mean, your, your mind is like a steel trap. I mean, you, the, the things you can remember, and of course, you know, you, um, you live them, you experience them, you, you write about them, but really you just are incredible. That's what my father used to, used to say, boy, your mind is like a steel trap. Nothing gets yep. in, nothing comes out. You know? But, uh, and he was right. But anyway, <laughs> Uh, no, you know, uh, it's because of stories, because I actually ha have a terrible memory, uh, you know, for, for names and numbers, uh, but I never forget stories. And that, it took me years to realize that that's really what I'm doing as a journalist. I'm a storyteller. Yes. And, you know, we, th that sounds trivial or something like just, just a guy who just sits around uh, uh, at, at the dark end of the bar, just mumbling. Uh, but uh, stories are so important. I, I um, uh, 
I mean, it took me a long time to, just to, to realize how important they are. But, but when, when you think about it, what, what is the Bible but stories? You know, uh, I mean, we all uh, know about the Ten Commandments. How many of us can say what all Ten Commandments were? Uh, some people can, but not not that many. But everybody knows the story of how Moses got the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, those stories are really what we remember, and and, and that's life. And and that's uh, also uh, I've talked to legal scholars. That's what lawyers do. That's what the law is about. That's what courts. And I've covered many trials, and uh, a, a, a trial to me is just a competition uh, between two storytellers. Uh, the uh, prosecution has got one story that they're telling as to what really happened out there. On Absolutely, the right. right. The defense has their story. No, no, that's not what happened. This is what happened. <laughs> Which story do you believe? You know, we're heading into a major trial now with uh, the uh, 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 George Floyd in uh, uh, Minneapolis, the, the uh, police brutality case. And uh, what really happened was that uh, uh, the police officer, the accused police officer who killed George Floyd, or was it some drugs he had in his system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's what's going to determine the outcome here. And that's something that we all need to remember, that uh, uh, we, we want our courts to be exact, fair, and just, but it all relies on stories. What story is, is more believable? Which one has, has the most impact on the audience or the jury? And uh, I got to remember Maya Angelou's um, uh, statement that uh, um, uh, people will forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I call the second commandment of journalism, really. <laughs> yeah. It's one thing to have the facts straight, but what kind of feeling is your reader or your audience going to have uh, from what you, uh, from the story that you're telling them? And that uh, uh, is really so much of the uh, essence of journalism, which I really picked up uh, between Mrs. Kendall in high school and uh, the uh, J school at Ohio U uh, that really got me off onto a start that uh, hasn't changed that much. I often, I feel like, like that, uh, what was that uh, wonderful uh, book, Everything I Learned, uh, what, Everything I Know I Learned in Kindergarten? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Everything I Know I Learned in J School. <laughs> no, I love that. Everything I Know I Learned really on the high school newspaper, actually. I mean, the same principles that I had to follow. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, high school journalism, it's the same that I'm practicing now. You know, number one, you want to be accurate and you want, you want to be fair, you want to be balanced. Uh, these are our, our basic principles that we have to take special steps to make sure we adhere to those principles. But it hasn't changed because uh, uh, you're only as good as your credibility in, in this business. And uh, the, the way to keep that is to be uh, fair and balanced, as the saying goes. Where do you think journalism is going for, for those students who are interested in telling stories and, um, you know, stitching together this fabric of, of memories and getting to the bottom of things and bringing um, conflicts to, to light? Um, so, you know, I talked a little bit about how technology has changed so much. And so journalism school has changed quite a bit. What are your thoughts on the next 10, 20 years of um, journalism reporting. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> What's that? I'm so glad you asked. Because, Are you? Okay, <laughs> good. Because the, the funny thing is, uh, and this has been going on since the late 90s, um, the funny thing is, I love going to journalism schools and, uh, and, and talking to students about the business, uh, high school or college, uh, because they teach me so much now, <laughs> you know? I mean, the way we gather and deliver the news has changed so much. And I feel like such a geezer in, in the newspaper world. Uh, but uh, again, the principles are, are the same. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, the best. Uh, I mean, I started to see this back in the uh, late 90s. I remember, um, I'll, ne I'll never forget uh, one night I was at a, at a Business Week magazine conference in um, uh, New York. And it was a um, uh, for for young entrepreneurs, uh, young uh, up and comers, and um, these were big name companies <laughs> that were getting started. 
and uh, I was at the, uh, we were seated for dinner and um, I guess they must want, want alphabetical order or something because I'm sitting next to this uh, young fellow whose name is Paige. And, I, and uh, we, we chuckled about our similar last names and uh, wondered, um, you know, um, uh, if, if we're distantly related, ha ha. And um, uh, I finally said, well, what, what do you do, Mr. Page? And he said, oh, well, me and my partner, Sergey Brin, uh, started a company called Google. And I said, oh, what's that? <laughs> I said, Google. He said, oh, you haven't heard of Google? And I, I said, oh, no, I, I haven't. He said, well, did you have your laptop in, in your hotel? And I said, uh, oh, yeah. And he, and he said, well, when you get back to your hotel room, just type in Google.com. It's going to change your life. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> I'll never forget that. My encounter with Larry Page. And it, uh, boy, I had no idea how much it was going to change my life uh, and uh, how much it was going to change the industry that I, I made my living in. Uh, but every time I go out to college campuses now, uh, I learned something new. I, I remember back, you know, just the idea, I can't even, even remember what you called. There was, there was this uh, iPod-sized video camera uh, that, that you could buy like, like in, in the late uh, 90s or the early 2000s there. Uh, and this was going to revolutionize uh, 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 revolutionized journalism. And, uh, and uh, one of my uh, uh, students I talked to at, at Ohio U uh, showed this to me. He said, well, I got to get one. Well, I hardly had bought that before uh, uh, suddenly the iPhone comes along. It's got camera right in there. In fact, the iPhone has everything in it that uh, the control room had during my brief stint in TV back in the early 80s in Chicago. I was on yeah. TV four years. Uh, and um, the funny thing is the iPhone's got it all in there. You can take video, you can do special effects, <laughs> you could do uh, you know conference calls, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that you needed a whole studio, a TV studio for uh, in the old days. Everybody's got it in their in their hip pocket now or in their purse. And that is uh, uh, but the content uh, it's all the content. Now, I'm no longer a journalist now. I'm a content provider mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's what we do. Uh, and, and that's where the game is. You know, people ask, uh, oh, uh, in the terrible that uh, 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 newspapers are, are going under, going out of business. And I said, well, newspapers are fading, but the news isn't. Uh, exactly. I got more. Yeah, you know, I got more readers than ever because they're digital and they're uh, mm -hmm. oh, oh, over the web, etc., uh, and uh, I've got more ways to tell my story now. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there is a um, uh, there is a uh, a sense that uh, um, we are uh, well, maybe well. A lot of folks are having trouble separating good news, and I mean um, accurate news, <laughs> from uh, distorted news or propaganda, uh, etc. Uh, news values are something that we're just beginning really to uh, both explore and to teach uh, because the credibility of the public, uh, you know, I, I used to be, I would just ignore the National Enquirer and not, and this is back when I was in J school um, at the uh, supermarket. Uh, and um, I, I would ignore what we all knew, which was that uh, as wonderful as the New York Times is, the National Enquirer sold more copies per day than the New York Times did. And, <laughs> This is still true. Tabloid journalism, as we called it, still uh, gets more of an audience. Only now it's a an issue of, of especially Facebook and other social network, networks, uh, false information going out over Facebook mm -hmm. uh, has a, a, a high enough credibility that it's disturbing. And we, all, we should all be disturbed by it uh, because uh, studies show that people are much more eager to, to uh, take the the distorted propaganda uh, information, the uh, paranoid uh, hoax information, uh, than to uh, look for uh, real good, solid information that is reliable. Uh, this is just human nature. Uh, we are, and, and I never realize as much as I do now how much we all want to believe what we want to believe, and that means we will be. Our inclination is to bypass. Uh, good information that is unpleasant uh, and then grab onto 
information that is false, but is what we want to believe or, or think, well, that's the way the world really works, or that's the way the world ought to work, whatever. Uh, and that's a, it, it seems like, like a little thing, but as we can, we're beginning to see how much trouble we can get into if we don't pay more attention to uh, accuracy and, and true fairness and balance. You have so many amazing stories and, and so much wisdom, so many, a little bit like an oracle yourself on, at some moments. It's been so great <laughs> to talk to you, and I feel like we could just go on and on. Um, oh, yeah. So if, if your son ever gets tired of listening to you, you just give me a call, and we'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to, <laughs> to hear all your story. <laughs> Thank you. you, you can, I, try, I try to make sure you, you don't regret that promise. Oh, never, never. I, I like to wrap up the podcast with a few questions about Ohio University. Um, I, I call them Ohio highlights. And before I get into that, I, I did just want to mention, um, I have interviewed a couple of, of folks who graduated around the time you did. Joanne Jansen was, um, she is a Hollywood choreographer and acting she graduated class of 1970. So she had a lot of interesting um, perspectives also on the National Guard presence on campus. Um, and then also um, your pal, President Emeritus, Roderick McDavis. Yes, he did. And I chatted as well. And I thought it was so interesting that, so you and he graduated a year apart from Ohio University and you were also both born in Dayton, also a year apart. So um you, you may yep. know that, but I'm, our, our listeners, I'm sure, don't know that. And, and I just thought that that was a neat little Ohio Bobcats tidbit. Great things come out of Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> great things, great things, great things. Yeah, I saw, I saw your podcast interview with him. It was really good. Oh, thank you. All the, all the good Ohio feels. That was a really, really warm convo. And, and I know he's going to love watching this one. Oh, that's great. Did my best. I will. So we know you uh, You lived in James Hall on the West Green. So we know that was one of your campus haunts. And of course, um, that you worked on the post. But I'm wondering if you had a, a favorite spot on campus when you were a student. Uh, uh, oh, well, this is a good question. Are you for for uh... For, for fun or for study? Yeah, let's let's go for fun because we know you were at the Post a lot. We know you were at Baker Center because, you know, oh, yeah. news and the only TV. But did you have a, a, a spot that you really just enjoyed? Yeah, well, we, uh, well I, 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 of course, think of, of uh, Baker Center. Uh, and because uh, that was where everybody hung out. Everybody had yeah. some room, really, that was uh, uh, their favorite uh, or rather, I always loved the old oak room, and because uh, uh, it was it, it, it was so elegant, you know. I said, I want to have a room like this in my house someday. Uh, <laughs> but there was also the um, uh, the um, I don't want to mix up my rooms now because I, th I think the oak room was the dining uh, uh, room in, uh, in the lower level, right down the hall from the uh, old uh, Ohio University Post Office. I mean, the newspaper, uh, but the uh, there was a uh, uh, that um, one big stately uh, lounge that, you, that uh, was there on the left. Well, describing Baker Center does no good for your generation because it's not even uh, the, old, the old Baker Center is now on the, on the land that Schoonover sits on. Now. Well, you're you're tickling my brain a little bit because um, when I was a student at Ohio University. Um, I frequented the original Baker Center, and so as you as you're walking down memory lane, I'm thinking, hmm, okay, what was that room called? So <laughs> <laughs> I remember the bunch of grapes room. That was uh, a, a, a real hangout down there. Yeah, in, that was in, down on the basement, the basement level. Yeah, right. And uh, that was what I was thinking. Was that the oak room next to it, the larger uh, room? Which I think serves beer. Well, we'll later serve beer. Well, the uh, coffee house was the front room. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, okay. That was it. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, well, you were just talking earlier about my great memory. You see, <laughs> 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 like all the other old alums. But uh, no, there's certain places. And you talk about uh, well, one I got to mention. This is not a hangout, but uh, you, you ever heard of the Kissing Circle? I haven't. Well, you see, this is, I mean, for, for my generation, it's just appalling that, uh, you know, your young people don't uh, appreciate the old traditions. No, there was a, the intersection right in front of book uh, on the center of the college green. Uh, you know, you got, you got the, the front gate 
uh, across from where Baker Center used to be. You got Cutler yeah. Hall. Uh, yeah. And uh, right in front of it, in the middle of the green, is where all the pathways cross. Sure. And, well, where they crossed, that was the kissing circle. Gotcha. It, and, and people, uh, uh, fraternities and sororities especially, uh, used to announce uh, big upcoming uh, dances or events by painting uh, their poster on the kissing circle itself, on the bricks. Uh, and uh, heaven knows how many hundreds of layers of paint were on those bricks uh, just in, in the four years I was there. Uh, but uh, that was like mistletoe, though. If you walked across, if you were crossing the green uh, and um, uh, with a, a date and you crossed the kissing circle, that was mistletoe. You had to kiss each other. Bobcat mistletoe. Sorry? Bobcat mistletoe. Bobcat mistletoe. That's what, what it was. And that was a, and, and I don't know, years later, I, I, I was on a campus visit and, and, and I said, oh, oh, the kissing circle. And I saw that nothing was painted on it. And these students didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> And I, I, I suddenly felt like my parents and grandparents. You young people don't appreciate the great traditions. <laughs> See, that's why I love asking these questions, because we hear these stories, uh, you know, that are so important, right? These memories and, and little facts that are so lovely. I'm sure I have some colleagues and friends out there who who will be, you know, mortified that I don't know what the kissing circle was. But um, to, to, to all of our listeners, what what great fun stuff. Now. Oh, yeah. Um, t- tell me about a, a favorite person. Maybe it was a professor or a great friend you had. Maybe someone you're still even in touch with today. Uh, any any particular person who who was well, important? The, there, there were quite a few, but but your question though it makes me think immediately of uh, Professor Richard Vetter, uh, the uh, uh, economist. And yes. um, we were J-, J majors. We were were required to take uh, what. Uh, what amounted to uh, two semesters uh, of uh, economics, oh, well, one class each semester. Uh, I think it was Econ 101, 102, whatever. And um, I, um, uh, so I uh, was not excited about <laughs> economics. Uh, all, all I wanted to know was how to make money. And that's one thing. Now, if you can teach me that. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I can't say that. I really got the hang of it. I uh, learned it well enough to uh, to, to pass and uh, get the credits. But I, um, uh, Professor Vetter was a new teacher at the time himself. Uh, I think it was like his second year at, at Ohio U. And it was a, a pretty large classroom uh, as uh, they were back then because us baby boomers, when we hit the campus, uh, suddenly they were made classes larger and uh, 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 your first year or two, uh, you were expected to uh, sink or swim uh, with this, uh, w- w- with the large classroom arrangements and all that. And in, in any case, so a uh, professor better did teach me a few things, uh, but, um, and, and, and he was uh, interesting and entertaining, but I can't say I, I really uh, learned a whole lot about economics, but I, I learned later, of course, you have to uh, not, not balance a checkbook, et cetera, et cetera. But what happened was in the 90s, uh, now I'm on the editorial board as well as a um, columnist at, at the Tribune, and um, I was uh, doing an, an editorial on college cal- costs, uh, how college tuition costs, et cetera, are skyrocketing and what can be done about it. And everywhere I would turn in researching this, I kept running across this um, uh, Richard Vetter. And, yes, very, uh, and, very active as an you know, expert. At American Enterprise Institute and all. And, and as they, you know, he's an uh, econ professor at, at Ohio University. I, uh, the name rung a bell. <laughs> so I called him up <laughs> and introduced myself and said, by the way, I think you were my professor back in 1967. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so anyhow. Long story short, we renewed our friendship. Well, we really started a friendship. I mean, we were, you know, I was just one student face in, in a crowd back then. Uh, but uh, I, uh, but he's, he's always been great. He's he is why I could recite to you that tuition in my freshman year was seven hundred seventy dollars because I I merely turned to him 
uh, for that because I, I couldn't remember exactly how much it was. Uh, I knew it was a lot cheaper than it is now. And he said, well, you know, I just recently looked this up because I couldn't believe it either because he had just arrived on campus back then. But, but he, uh, he he was he was the one who found it, it was seven hundred and seventy. That was just the, just the tuition with room and board. It was about twelve hundred and forty. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, this is something that um, uh, so our friendship was renewed, and he, I could say, is without a doubt one of the best professors I ever had. I just didn't appreciate it until forty years afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that so often the case? Yeah, when I, I get back to campus, I, I, I try I try to see him. He came to a speech I gave at the local Rotary Club there, and uh, uh, just just a, a wonderful guy. And I said, "No, how many of your students appreciate <laughs> you as much <laughs> as they should?" <laughs> but I said, "That's okay, Clarence. If you're an example, they'll learn over time." <laughs> exactly. They can't get exactly. away from money. We all care about it. Well, it has been such a treat today. If I were to take away a, a little quote, it would be stories are so important. And that's Indeed. what I would that's what I would take away from 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 my talk with you. And I can't wait to share this interview with our Bobcats and, and just with other folks. Thank you so, so much for all you continue to do for Ohio University and keeping the Bobcat Nation, you know, alive in, in your heart. So many students have benefited from you. And, and thanks to this podcast, now so many alumni will as well. And, well, thank, um, you for, thank you for being part of my story. <laughs> absolutely. We hope to have you back on campus just as soon as we can. Hope so. All right. Thanks so much, Clarence. Hey, thank you.